Good morning, 7th graders of Respect Academy. Hope you had a fine weekend. We are back in our books. Bronx Masquerade by Nikki Grimes. Today we're going to be starting on page 82. Just rolling back a moment. We last heard from Tanisha Scott. She had a poem called For the Record. It's on page 79 that I feel like we didn't discuss enough. Maybe we'll find a chance today. Um, If you remember, she was rather light-skinned and sick of people talking about her light skin. And the poem is basically telling us where that skin came from and how she's no different than anyone else in, in her school. So, starting on page 82, we start with Devin. This is Devin Alexander. We've seen him before. When we see characters numerous times, we don't see the last name anymore. Devin was a jock who secretly is really into this poetry stuff. He's into making his, growing his mind, expanding his mind, reading poetry, reading in general. So let's see what he has to say today. I look up from my lunch tray and catch Tanisha's eye. While she stands in the cafeteria line, we nod. Yo, brother, says Tyrone, thinking I'm nodding to him. I wave and turn away. Tanisha's one fine sister, but I never say that to her, not to her face. She gets tired of hearing it from all the other guys. They look at her and that's all they see, what's on the surface. That's what she told me when we talked once after Open Mic Friday. We talked about superficial judgments. How people look at you and think they know who you are, what you are. How they put you in a box, jock, china doll, whatever. That's one thing me and Tanisha got in common. We we know all about being put in a box. I feel like I'm going to be climbing out of the one mark, dumb jack dumb jock for all my life. Hey, jump shot! I hear somebody call me from behind. It's Mike from the basketball team. I nod. Then I go back to reading Imamu Amiri's, or I'm sorry, Imamu Amiri Baraka's preface to a 20 volume suicide note. Mike slams his tray down beside me and he sits. Top of 83. What's that you're reading? Baraka, I tell him. Poetry. Oh, right, you got that class. At first I don't say anything. Then I decide. No, man, it's not for class. I'm reading it for me, actually. You gots to be kidding me. No. That's so lame, man. I keep my finger in in the book, and I turn to face him. You ever read Baraka? No answer. You should check him out. Hey, do what you want, man. I ain't interested. Mike picks up his tray. He moves to another table, shaking his head. I go back to my reading, seeing as how he'd given me permission and all. Forget this. Tonight, our team plays Bronx Science. When I get on the bus with the rest of the guys, I'm taking a copy of Baraka's book with me to read, and I'm going to make sure everybody sees it. Especially Mike. Turn the page to 84. It's Open Mic Friday. The name of the poem is Black Box by Devin Hope. In case I forgot to tell you, I'm allergic to boxes. Black boxes, shoe boxes, new boxes, U boxes, even cereal boxes. Boasting champions? It's all a lie. I've peeked inside and what I found? We're flakes. Make no mistake. I make no exceptions for Cracker Jack or Christmas glitter. Haven't you noticed? I'm made of skeleton, muscle, and skin. 
My body is the only one I belong in. But you like your boxes, so keep them. Mark them, geek, wimp, bully. Mark them, china doll, brainiac, or plain dumb jock. Choose whatever. Choose whatever box you like, Mike. Just don't put me in one, son. Believe me, I won't fit. Page 86, Tyrone. The brother's right. I look around this class, and nobody I see fits into the box I used to put them in. Starting with Mr. Ward. I figured him for a lightweight do-gooder who would last about five minutes in this neighborhood. But he's stuck, and he got this poetry thing going. He even reads his own stuff sometimes. He's okay. Devin's okay, too. I don't know how bright the other jocks are, but there's nothing dumb about this, brother. Mr. Ward says you have to take people one at a time. Check out what's in their head and heart before you judge. Word. Page 87. We got a new character. Sterling S. Hughes. Devin shook his head when he saw me stand in the lunch line yesterday, fingering an imaginary fret, making the appropriate sound effects. Friend or not, he thinks I'm crazy. But the brother behind me got into it, snapping his fingers to the rhythm I set. Yeah, he said. Preacher got it going on. My name is Sterling Sampson, but everybody calls me Preacher. I intend to become a science teacher, not a preacher. But I don't mind being called one, just as so long as you don't call me Samson. I'm hoping to end up in a little better shape than he did. I turn up the brother behind me and eased into a smile. I play a real guitar at church every Sunday. You ought to come by and check me out sometime. Judging by the way the brother cut his eyes at me, his appearance on the steps of First Baptist Church seemed highly unlikely. Still, you never know. I went back to my invisible string plane to keep my fingers limber for later. I had promised to hold the bass line for some of the brothers reading, it, reading at this week's open mic. Mr. Ward was kind enough to lock my guitar up in his office in the morning, so I wouldn't have to worry about it walking away before then. Assuming I made it to his class without any trouble? A brother named Leon accidentally bumped into me as I approached the cashier. He spilled, or should I say, poured a cup full of honey on my shoes. My new shoes. Oops, looks like Mr. Goody Two-Shoes got a mess to clean up, he said, laughing. His buddies joined in. I stared down at my shoes, counting. One, two, three, four. By the time I reached ten, I realized counting was not going to suffice. I need you, Lord. Hold back the Samson in me. I may not have his strength, but you know I have his temper. I counted backward from ten. Felt my breath slowly evening out. A still, small voice reminded me to return good for evil. Reminded me that my plans for the future do not include fisticuffs or expulsion. I am college-bound and nothing is going to keep me from it. Besides, these poor fools are only trying to get a rise out of me. They're only trying to prove that the peace of God is non-existent. But how can they? I looked up at Leon, and I shook my head. Then I grabbed him by the shoulders, kissed him loudly on both cheeks, and gave him a bear, bear hug. Get off me, man, he said, trying to pull away. When I finally let him go, I whispered, Leon, I forgive you. Fear blotted out the pupils in his eyes. Man, he yelled, you some kind of freak. I smiled, strummed my imaginary guitar, and sang. I'll be a fool for Christ, not just once, but twice. Leon and his friends backed away, as if I'd set a match to them. They put as much difference between us as possible. You sick, man, Leon called over his shoulder. Just stay away from me. It's always something with these guys. Either they're doing... They're trying to draw me into an infantile game of the dozens so we can trade insults left and right, or they're slapping porno pictures inside my locker, hoping to set me off. If they had some direction in their lives, like Raul, Devin, or Reynard, 
they wouldn't have time to worry about me one way or the other. Which is precisely why I want to teach. To give young brothers like Leon some direction. Even Wesley has direction. Although the brother could clean up his language. Sometimes he sounds like a thug in training. Leon's not much better. If only Leon and his friends knew how lame their antics are. As if any of that could stop me from believing in God. All my life, I've seen my mother pray. And all my life, I've seen her prayers answered. There was the time my baby brother was dying of pneumonia. Top of 90. And the doctors had given up, but she prayed until the fever broke. There was the time she was laid off from her job, and the refrigerator was empty. And she bowed her head over an empty pot and prayed for God to fill it. That night, a woman upstairs begged her to accept a bag of frozen meats and vegetables because she was moving the next day, and she hated to see good food go to waste. We had steaks that night, and we never had steaks. There were lots of times like that. See there, Mom would say, that's God's hand. If you have God ha God's hand on your life, everything will be all right. So of course I believe, and I believe big. I'm believing God's going to get me and my three brothers into manhood, into college, and off of these streets, with no more than a week Maybe a couple of black eyes between us. How's that for believing? The change bell rang, and I was still cleaning off my shoes. I could have used a few extra minutes to work on my own poem. It took me a while to get into this whole poetry thing. Not that I don't like it. I read God's Trombones by James Weldon Johnson, and some of the work by County Cullen, like Simon the, Cer the Cyrenian Speaks. And I like what the brothers had to say, but their styles, they don't suit me. Then Mr. Ward turned me into turned me on to Reverend Pedro Pietri, who is more my speed. And even if he is kind of old, he knows how to put God and the street in the same sentence. And I figured if I'm going to write poetry at all, that's what I want to do. So I put together a few. I couldn't tell if they were any good, but I decided to read one anyway. If I get a laugh, it won't be the first time. The bell rang one last time. I took a few two, uh, took a few bites of my sandwich, wrapped up the rest and tossed it in my bookcase for later. I told my growling stomach to be quiet, and I headed to Mr. Ward's office for my guitar. Page 92. D-Train by Sterling S. Hughes. He squeezed through the subway doors, a young gun thirsty for the kind of coke you can't sip through a straw. He sized up the passengers, chose his prey, a wrinkled woman at the tail end of her charitable years, who fears her own shadow with good reason, he lunged at her, demanded her cash to replenish his stash of powdered death. No one blinked or came to her aid at first. Then in, he beamed. Light streamed from his fingers, singed anyone, singed anyone caught without a robe of righteousness around his back. The lack of goodness in the young gun's heart was oxygen to the fire, and so he burned a good long while before I woke. The dream stoked my faith in the judgment and justice that will come some day, or this afternoon. Soon, I turn up the collar of my white robe, relieved to know God's got me covered, because I'm good, but not that good. 94. The brother took me to a whole other place. I'm not sure I got all of it, but I got that he don't call himself no angel. Of course, if Mr. Goody Two Shoes ain't no angel, what does that make me? Never mind. He sure worked that rhythm. I know that much. He snuck a little rhyme in there too. I like that. Go on, preacher. Looks like God got himself a poet.